Just like Apple Bites. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, and this is show number 987. Well, the alert amongst you will have heard me say Wednesday just now, which is your hint that the show is out super early because we're off to Texas this weekend to stand in the rain and look at clouds where the eclipse was supposed to be. It also means there will be no live show this coming Sunday. We will return to our usual tomfoolery on Sunday, April 14th. But don't worry, we're keeping our streak alive as we begin to approach the 1,000th episode of the NoSilicast. Most of us are currently abled, so the accessibility tools we're learning about from CSUN's Assistive Tech Conference might not yet apply to you. But if you create content for the web, you probably want as many people as possible to enjoy what you create. This next interview from CSUN is about a free, beautiful, easy-to-use tool to analyze your web pages to make sure they're accessible to those with different kinds of impairments. When I'm doing web development and I'm uh, kind of pushing my community towards doing this, I like to test my sites for accessibility for the work that I'm doing. And one of the things I've been using is the Wave Accessibility Tool, which allows me to do that, gives me feedback on exactly what's right and what's wrong. It's maybe not the cleanest, prettiest thing I've ever used in my life, but I'm here with, and I've forgotten your name one more time, Oliver Emberton from Silk Tide, who is a free service that's going to help us do a better job of testing our sites for accessibility. Is that correct? That's very correct. Yes, we went out of our way. We've been using Wave for about a decade or so. We went out of our way to look at Wave, to look at Axe, to look at all of the major free tools out there. And we took all of the best bits of all of them, and we shamelessly stole them, and we made them better. Okay. And we're giving it away for free. Well, that, that's, that's my language. So in general, what I'm used to being able to do is to just look at my website and see, have I missed any uh, image descriptions? Yeah. Uh, what about, co- contrast is a big one. That one's always really hard for me to fix because it doesn't ever tell me what to do about it. It just says, nope, it's wrong. And so I guess another number and it says, nope, it's still wrong. You know, hot or cold, hot or cold. Well, I know why that's tricky, because the thing with color is you can suggest colors, but sometimes there's a human judgment component, right? Should you make it lighter? Should you make it darker? Should you rotate all of your oranges around to become reds? Reds are easier to make contrasting than orange, for example. People don't know that. Right. Um, Just give me, give, me a, give me a hint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. Um, I mean, we, we provide contrast tools. It's built in there, uh, much like all of these others, right? We give you the color dropper, we'll scan your page, we'll automatically find the text where the contrast is too low, uh, where the contrast is good enough, and we'll tell you things like, this text could be larger, or you could bump the contrast. So, you know, choose. Oh, okay, so make design choices that can still achieve the same goal. That's the aim. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, how does this work? Is this a separate app or a plugin? What is this? Yeah, so right now it's a Chrome extension. Um, so it's completely free. You just Google for Silk Tide in the Chrome store, and then you just install it. And it takes like one mouse click, and then you have an array of free tools, which includes the color contrast you mentioned, and a whole ton of other stuff, like a screen reader simulator, for example. A screen reader simulator? How does that work? Uh, well, it's kind of what it sounds like on the tin. So uh, we, we work with screen readers all day long, right? And if you've ever had the experience yourself, you'll know it's really, really difficult to set up a screen reader. Screen reader is a lot of work, right? Um, typically, many, many hours installing an awkward piece of software. Unless you're on a Mac and it's already there. Well, yeah, I don't like to brag. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> but, but, no, but even then, right? So I, I do use a Mac. Um, and it's still tricky because you have to go through like a learning process. There's like an entire wizard. Oh, it's not easy to learn. I didn't yeah. say that, but it's at least already there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've been using one of those for years and I still get lost. I still sometimes get trapped somewhere and I'm like, how do I get out of here? And I reset the whole thing. So what we did is we just built a one-click button inside this tool that just simulates the screen reader inside any web page you're viewing in Chrome. So you just go to the page that you want to test, and you push the button, and now you're using a fake screen reader, which works just like NVDA, except we tell you how to use it down the side of the screen, so you don't need to sit there and do a three-hour course. So you don't need to learn the screen reader. It's already there. Uh, an example of where I, I was uh, using this with XP Past WD in our development process with Helma and Mike Price and some others is uh, we, were, we were trying really hard to make sure we had labels on everything so that screen readers would be okay. But I discovered by using a test screen reader that there were like two areas out in the middle of nowhere that were reading things out on, on, uh, uh, audibly, and that's yeah. not what we wanted. Didn't realize we were causing that, but you'd be able to see that with Silk Tide. Yeah, that, and that's exactly why you need it, right? Because you can do all of the, the abstract learning that you like. You can sit there and read the theory, but there's no substitute for actually experiencing it yourself. 
Exactly, I mean, exactly. I mean, imagine if you were making TV back in the day, I remember this, you're making TV for black and white TVs. How old am I? Don't ask. Um, and no, so uh, as, as late as in the 90s, they were making TV ads and they had to make sure that they still worked on black and white televisions. Sounds crazy. And you can try and guess what that's like, or you can just find a black and white television. And if you don't do that, you can do all the theory. You can be like, oh, I think this color works. And I think that, no, you just need to try it. Right, there's, right. there's no substitute for that. The problem has been with screen readers is that's incredibly hard. And we were like, can we make that something you can do in two mouse clicks, which it now is. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. So um, can we take a look at it and see how this works? Absolutely. Um, all right. We're going to do a live demo here. So now this, uh, the audience is um, uh, audio and video. Are you going to be able to hold that still enough up in the air? Um, oh, I see your point. Uh, shall we try this? Let's yes. Try this. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk through what's going on because there's audio only listeners as well. Okay. So I'm just going to open the extension, which is one click up here. He's got a website open called fakeuniversity.com. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, to protect the guilty, we decided to make a free website, uh, which is deliberately riddled with all manner of accessibility issues. Um, so, so this opened up a, a sidebar on the left. It's a silk tide and it's got a bunch of different options for accessibility checker, color contrast, alt text, screen readers. All right. Yeah, all sorts. So the sort of thing that people will often want to do is they might want to go into, say, focus order. This is one that I like. So if I click on focus order, this shows you the order of parts of the page as you would tab through them. So if you're using assistive tech, you can see how you would step through the different So parts. what we're seeing on screen is, is a purple line with numbers on it. And uh, so when it gets to each button, it's got the number there. I see eight. And then there's a picture of an image. That's nine. Mm -hmm. And that would have been also useful in what we were doing. We had a, a banner that was in the order four. So you'd get content, content, content. Here's a picture for no reason. And this would have visually really told it to us. Absolutely. And then in the same way, I'm sure we've all been here where you're like, well, what's the alternative text on this page? If you want to see it, you can click on this and we'll tell you the alt text, for example, is missing on this image. And we'll tell you what it is on other parts of the page. So these are actually all missing alt text. In fact, this is kind of a bad example. Let me show you a website that does it well. So, if I so now he's on the BB oh, BBC. Oh, <laughs> the Brit's got to bring this up. Well, of course I do. I am, I am still technically, legally half British. I heard you're a Texan. <laughs> I am indeed a Texan, and uh, I won't deny it. And I prefer Texas to England. Don't hold it against me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Controversy. You're finding yeah. it here. It's a spicy take. <laughs> anyway, um, but no, what you can see is alternative text on the screen overlaid over these images. So, so, yeah, on every image, we can see what the alt text is, and uh, we're seeing a lot of green on the BBC website. That's right. But one of the things that we found is that when we were looking at websites or testing or improving websites, you want to see the alternative text in context. You want to know what it applies to without doing lots of extra work. So the idea of this is it just makes it really, really obvious. Oh, yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to come back out of that. Let's go back to the, uh, the, mis the fake university website. And I'm just going to show you the screen reader simulator because this is definitely one of my favorite things. So is this going to be talking out loud that I should move the mic down to the speaker? Um, I'll turn the sound up a little bit. It's going to be hard to judge. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, so if I click on this. Oh, there we go. I'm going to skip next. Link. Button toggle navigation. Heading one, choose your future. List with zero items. Paragraph embark on an extraordinary educational journey at Fake University, where the boundless realm of knowledge seamlessly converges. Okay, I'm, I'm going to mute it now because that's going to get annoying very quickly. <laughs> so we all know what a screen reader is like. Um, the idea of this is that we've made a sidebar that gives you, firstly, immediately obvious controls on how to use this, right? So previous, next, and select. So you can go through here. I can select this button, for example, if I wanted. Um, and then everything that's being spoken out loud is shown here as a transcript. So if you're not able to remember what was just happening, you can read it later on. Um, the idea is, for, for example, I might be a web developer working on this, and I don't, have, um, I don't have perfect memory, for one, or I don't want to turn this audio on and listen to the robot voice throughout my day. I can just leave it silently there and read the narration. Um, and then there's a whole ton of stuff, because of course a real screen reader has things like you might skip to headings and so on, right? And when you're doing that, you need to know your shortcuts. There are various shortcuts for landmarks, headings, links, form inputs, etc. We've simulated all of those, and you can run those and, uh, and see how they behave on your, your site. Oh, that is really slick. I like this. And it isn't ugly. 
Well, All right. This is a hard one. You know how I feel about contrast. Let's see the, the uh, contrast uh, color checker. Okay. So there's a couple of things here. So the color contrast checker, we've got a tool here designed to help do the thing that you would expect, which is, you know, you can pick out any two colors. That's just a silly example, but uh, you can pick out any colors you want if you wish. So you can do, for example, that. We also have a... Well, hang on one second here. We're apparently... We're getting the hook. Okay, one hour to closing time. Okay, so um, go going back to the uh, color contrast checker, the I think that's got the thing I wanted, mm -hmm. was that when you go, when he's flipping through, he's able to see and, and uh, choose different colors right on the fly and see whether it fixes the contrast. I've had to go back into my into my web design, into the HTML and change it in order to see and then rerun uh, the wave tool. Yeah, so I will be honest, at the moment, we, we do let you change, uh, sorry, you can see here the colors. We're highlighting, the, I don't know if you can see this, this part of the page where the, the contrast is not good enough. We'll show you what's going on. But we don't currently give you like a tool here to preview changing that color. Okay. Now that you said it out loud to me and put me on the spot, I'm like, that's a good feature. We should do that. <laughs> well, I thought I just saw you do it a second ago. Um, you picked two colors and you uh, said that's not very, that's oh, not a good example. Saying. No, no, no. You're right. Yeah. So that's, sorry, that's something else. That's for like, you can look at any two colors you'd like. So for example, I could go, how does that color contrast with say that color? And yeah, that, that, oh, you, okay. can, that you can. Yeah. Do. So just take that little tool there and stick it over in the other color checker so I can get it right. In the, in the uh, when we're going back to the, not just color contrast, I build this capability you have here over into when I've got a fail. I where see. I can say, okay, let me pick, let me darken, darken, darken. Dark. Okay, good enough. Got I you. got my 4.52 to one uh, contrast ratio. That makes perfect sense. I, well, uh, I have been working on this project for a while. I'd be very happy to take this back to the team and say, oi guys, sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. All yep. right, this is this is really fantastic. Is that uh, is that all the high points there? There is just one more thing I'll show you because it's easily missed. Um, everything you've seen here works on different devices. So if I wanted, I could have done that on an iPad, or I could have done it on say an iPhone. And so, so he's he's got a simulator running on all of these. That's right. And so even things like the screen reader um, or things like the focus order will work on all of those devices. Oh my gosh, this is spectacular and it's free. It's 100% free and it always will be. Is that because you're a wonderful human being or you've got a business plan that on something else? Um, it could be that or it could be I'm very bad at running a business. You're going to have to decide for yourself. <laughs> all right. Well, Oliver, this has been fantastic. Again, it's Silk Tide and you just look it up in the, uh, in the Chrome store. You can run it on Microsoft Edge or on uh, any Chromium browser, I assume. Um, at the moment, it is literally just Google Chrome, but we are working on other browsers as we speak. Not on Edge. Usually everything that works on Chrome works on Edge. Well, actually, if, okay. It might. It might do. You know what? Yeah. I don't know. I'll try it. I'll let you know right. if it doesn't. <laughs> okay. All right. Absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. After I got home, I tried out Silk Tide with Microsoft Edge and it worked perfectly. So that answered the question. One of the nifty parts of having this as an extension in the browser is it also means you can check your work when you're building your website locally, even before you ever push it up to the public. So in Microsoft Edge or in Google Chrome, just go to the place where you look for extensions for your browser and look for Silk Tide and check out your websites today. I recently read Arnold Schwarzenegger's book, Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life. It's such a great book in so many ways. One of the things Arnold really dislikes is how people say he's a self-made man. He argues in the book about this by pointing out how many people helped him get to where he is today. It's really great fun to learn how he set his goals to be a bodybuilder in Austria before the sport really existed there. Then he set his goals to be an, an Olympian. Then he had a vision to be a movie star, then a comedic movie star, and then the governor of California, and then finally to run the President's Council on Physical Fitness. But it was the very last section of the book that struck me the most, and that was when he started working with the Special Olympics. He talks in this section about the best thing in life, which is helping other people. The entire book is written very much in his voice, and you can hear his passion for what he has gained by the experience of helping others. I highly recommend the book, and this idea has so much relevance for doing the podcast and things I do in my personal life. I get so much energy out of helping other people. Ten years ago, on the 500th anniversary of the NoSilicast, I told you about a crazy power outage we had in our neighborhood. The only good thing that came out of it was that we ended up meeting our delightful neighbor, Lupe, as a result. 
Steve helped her with her circuit breakers, and we've been good friends ever since. After I got to know Lupe, she asked me if I'd help her pick out a new iPhone. You know how much I love to spend other people's money, so we toddled off to the Apple store together and we picked out a shiny new iPhone 7 for her. Fast forward to now, and Lupe's getting up there in years and unfortunately has macular degeneration, which has seriously compromised her vision. She doesn't get out much anymore, so her iPhone is really her lifeline more than ever. She suggested to me a while ago that she needed a new iPhone, so I went over to visit her to figure out which iPhone to buy for her. My first thought was to see whether she needed voiceover yet, but she assured me that she could still see well enough to do what she wanted to do. While email is no longer an option for her, she could still call people, listen to messages, and read texts with a magnifying glass. I suggested that if she was going to get a new iPhone, she might consider one of the big iPhones, such as an iPhone 14 or 15 Plus. I figured the much bigger screen would make the very large text she needs fit more on the screen and be overall easier to read. She asked to see my phone, which is the medium-sized iPhone 15 Pro. She compared it to her iPhone 7 and said, while it was a little bit bigger, let me try to slip it into the pocket of my house coat. Well, it just barely fit. It was pretty snug. Then she tried to fit it in this little bandolier purse she throws around her neck when she's moving about. And again, it was snug, but it did fit. She declared that a bigger iPhone like the Plus was out of the question. I told her, I said, hey, I'll sew a bigger pocket on your house coat and I'll buy you a new purse. But she pointed out, she said, I have three house coats. And she just decided this wasn't going to work. At this point, I didn't know what problem a new phone would solve for her if bigger wasn't an option. Her iPhone 7 was working just fine and it fit those pockets and purse. She didn't need a faster phone nor one with a better camera. Well, the next time I went to visit, she brought up this phone thing again. And we had essentially the same conversation. I'm not against the idea of buying gadgets someone doesn't need, but I couldn't figure out what problem I was solving by recommending a new phone, and what phone should I even recommend? I did notice one problem I could solve. Lupe was really, really cold. She says she has to keep the house cold because having the heat on dries out her eyes. I gotta tell you, even I was cold in her house. So, rather than buying her a new iPhone, I crocheted an afghan for her. It really was a labor of love, and I chose a pattern of cream, gold, and purple, because purple is her favorite color. The pattern was a dream to crochet. It's super soft, and it was a really fun pattern. If you're wondering, it was the Seaside Ripple Afghan from Mary Maxim. Now, remembering what Arnold said, it's helping others that give us, gives us the most fulfillment. I knew that every time she wrapped herself in this blanket, not only would she be warmer, she'd know I'd been thinking of her when I was making it. So, just a few days after I brought her the blanket, she called me in distress because she was having battery problems on her iPhone 7. She said it was going from 100% to zero. Now, I assumed she was having a charging problem, so I dashed over with a new charger block, a fresh lightning cable, and a wooden toothpick to pick lint out of the connector port, just in case that was the problem, because it often is. But I should have listened more closely to exactly what she was saying. She was telling me that she would charge it to 100%, so not a charging problem, but then it would be at 0% shortly thereafter. I opened up the battery settings on her phone, and I gotta tell you, I put a screenshot of this battery graph in the show notes to illustrate what she was saying. I've never seen an iPhone battery graph like this before. It looks like an L. It shows the battery level going straight down from 100% to 4%, and then it hovers there for a few hours before suddenly tanking to zero. Now, remember how I said I couldn't figure out why I should get her a new phone just because her phone was working fine? Yeah, not so much now. Lupe and I went through options on the Apple website to choose an iPhone 14 for her. I still couldn't talk her into the plus size phone, and I didn't think there was really any reason to push an iPhone 15 on her. We debated the merits of Apple Care Plus, and even though she doesn't leave the house all that much, she did like the idea of the version that gives you theft and loss protection. She told me to get her a screen protector so she'd be covered there as well. When I was checking out her charging situation, I noticed that the very long cable she uses was frayed near the connector, so she asked for a new long charging cable as well. I found a nifty 3-meter braided USB-A to lightning cable from Belkin for $30, and it, the thing, a couple things are cool about it. Braided, always good, but has a little rubber strap for coiling the cable that's really nice. 
It also has a magnetic disc on that strap and then a matching magnet with 3M sticky stuff on the back so you can stick it to something. So she can take the end of the cable and just stick it to this thing that sits on her, on her table all the time, and that way the end of the cable doesn't fall on the floor. She really liked that feature. At her age and with her vision, turns out chasing down a drop cable on the floor isn't nearly as much fun as it used to be. Now, we ran into a few challenges setting up her new iPhone the next day. She didn't have enough storage space on iCloud to run a backup, and I didn't have the login info available to clean it up to be able to make room. We did the ad hoc network dance where the old phone scans the swirly graphic on the new phone, and then they have this whole little conversation between each other to transfer all of her data. In less than a half an hour, all of her apps, data, and wallpaper were there, and the accessibility features for enlarged text were all set up on the new phone. It was really cool. While this worked swimmingly, we ran into a big snag. The iPhone 7 has a physical SIM, and the iPhone 14 has an eSIM. Now, it's really easy to move from a physical SIM to an eSIM. I've done it myself. But the process requires iOS 16 or higher on both phones. Her iPhone 7 was back on something like, I don't know, iOS, iOS 14. So I had to make that dreaded call to AT&T. Now, you're going to be shocked to hear this but I have nothing but good things to say about my call with AT&T. While there was a long wait time, they offered to call me back in 11 to 13 minutes, and they actually called back right at 11 minutes. We were soon connected to Lala, and she simply could not have been more helpful. Lala gave careful instructions, but, you know, not so slow that it drove me nuts. She had kind of a cute way of telling me to look for things in settings. She'd say, gently scroll down to the bottom. Take your time. I'll wait. She was also pretty funny when we were working on actually moving the phone number between the two phones. She said, if we're lucky today, I can move it using the IMEI2 number. I laughed at how she said that, like you had to be lucky. And I said, boy, it's funny how the more you know about technology, the more you realize it's at least 20% witchcraft. She laughed and said, don't you know it? She said, I'm going to use that line. Anyway, once the phone number transferred, she was successful, I was ready to hang up, but she insisted on testing a few more things. She told me to turn off Wi-Fi and test making a phone call, sending a text message, and accessing the internet. Her thoroughness was awesome. I had a few other things to clean up on the phone, and she insisted on staying with me until everything was working properly. As I told her, I could not possibly have been happier with the tech support I got from Lala at AT AT&T. Now, once we had her phone functional, I decided to see if she'd be willing to give Face ID a try. I explained that her new iPhone doesn't have a home button, but Face ID should be able to unlock her phone even more quickly. I'd been kind of dreading that change from Touch ID, but Lupe is smart and a quick learner and was delighted with how well Face ID worked. She's patient with the fact that it doesn't work all the time and doesn't seem to mind typing in her passcode, you know, from time to time. Now, a little update from when I first wrote this. I went over to see her today and Face ID has stopped working and I'm not sure why. I tried type turning off a, requiring attention, which I thought that might be it. And we actually erased the, the uh, Face ID reading and had her do it all over again, but it's not working ever right now. So I've got to noodle why that would be, but I'll get back to her and get it fixed. Now, she also told me to tell her son how much she owed me for the phone and accessories. And I had to wonder, What's this guy going to think of hearing that from me? Hi, I just helped your elderly mother with something. Can I have $1,200? It pretty much couldn't have sounded any dodgier if I'd asked for the money in Target gift cards, right? Well, luckily, she explained to him that it was the nice neighbor who, who had crocheted her the Afghan, so he knew I was legit. But it could have all been part of my master plan. Well, a little while after I left her, I got a phone call from her asking me how to delete a phone call. I wasn't clear on what she meant, so I trotted over, and I asked her to describe what she wanted to do in more detail. She explained that her son had called, but then she didn't know how to delete the call afterwards. It took me a while to figure out what she meant. She was talking about quitting the app. She used to do this by double-clicking the home button and then swiping up. I didn't bother explaining to her that she doesn't need to, to quit apps, but instead I taught her the gesture to swipe in an arc with her thumb from the bottom of the screen. She picked up the gesture pretty quickly. I told her that this was the gesture I had the most trouble adapting to when I moved from Touch ID to Face ID. I had her practice it four or five times, and by the time I left, she had the hang of it. I also today taught her to use the gesture to swipe down from the upper right to get to Control Center and hit the uh, flashlight, and she 
got it right away. I had her do it two or three times and it was just like, yeah, I know this now. So it's such a delight to work with smart people. It's just, it's just so nice. Well, the final process of helping Lupe was to give her Pat Nengler's phone number. You've heard me mention Pat a lot of times. She's an Apple certified consultant and one of the most patient and gentle people I know. It's not that I wanted to stop helping Lupe, but I'll be out of town for a few days and I was afraid there might be something maybe I forgot to set up for her and I didn't want her to have to wait nearly a week to get sorted out. I would trust Pat with my own grandchildren. In fact, I've done that. And so I trust her to take good care of Lupe while I'm gone. Also, when it came time to do the screen protector, I told her that Steve was better at it than I was. And then um, when I finally, when we actually got the screen protector, I said, oh, okay, I could do it for her. And she goes, no, no, I trust Steve. I want Steve to do it. So Steve's the one who put on the screen protector. Now, Lupe keeps insisting that she must do something for us to pay me back. And I told her, all I want is for her to be my friend. As Arnold explained, helping people is one of the greatest joys in life. I may let her buy us lunch when we get back, but only because it would make her happier. All right, let's head back to CES for some more cool gadgets. A longtime manufacturer uh, favorite, I would say, of the Apple community is the Satechi line of products. And I am here with Chris Martinez to talk about what they've got this year. How are you doing today? I'm doing super. So let me show you what we're going to be announcing. Oh, before you start, I always forget to tell people this. This is an audio podcast, and some people will be on video. So use a lot of detail to describe what you're looking at. Absolutely. We'll do so. So first and foremost, <laughs> we're launching our new uh, Qi2 product portfolio. So Qi2 is the evolution of MagSafe. MagSafe meaning you can magnetize your device to charge it. So the and charge now at 15 watts without uh, being licensed by you were, Apple. You were skipping ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Love it, though. I want to make sure the audience knows. That's why this is cool. 100%. So with this device here, you charge your, Air, your Apple Watch on the back, 5 watts. It's also fast charging. It also provides charging for your AirPods in the front. Uh, as well as, as you said, the new Qi2 module that charges up to 15 watts. This also provides vegan leather, so a soft finish touch. What's does this articulate where I attach my, uh, my, my phone? It does have an articulating arm here. Okay. Also, what's uh, unique, it folds completely flat, so it allows you to travel. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's you nice. Can see, you can see the design, how flat and flush that is. It's like a it's like a standard uh, a stand up stand, except exactly. it, it folds flat for travel. Very exactly, nice. and that's what we're trying to do: empower the consumer to travel easily, while empowering them to power all their different devices. So and what's this, the name for this? This is our new three in one stand, a foldable stand. And what's the price point on that? That's going to be one twenty nine, and then it's little brother which has a similar design minus the watch module, is at $79.99. Charging okay. two different devices, your AirPods as well as your device, also charging at a full 15 watts, and as you can see, also flat folds. Even thinner. Flat. Everybody's in love with this kind of a design now because of standby mode. Absolutely. Everybody loves to have their phone up on the stand. It's, it's the Ex perfect way to charge and, and know what time it is. Exactly, and to your point, what we did is we're taking advantage of that. So these are gonna be announced tomorrow, available in about the May timeframe, what we're also going to be announcing later in the uh, summer is a couple new variants. So this device is similar, but also allows you that complete pad version for the consumer so who wants to So this is more it. like, uh, what is that, like seven inches by four inches, and then each of the pads lay flat exactly. when you fold it down? It's completely fl lays flat versus the other vertical design. What this also allows is for consumers to utilize nightstand mode for your watch or the articulating arm to also use standby mode. Very nice. Also folds completely flat for travel, has the same vegan leather soft touch, all aluminum design all the way around. So whatever your look is. Now I'm excited about this wallet looking, MagSafe stand looking thing. Describe so, this. So this is our new uh, magnetic wallet that launched with the uh, iPhone 15. In addition to it being an, uh, available on our site in four different colors, it also has uh, exclusive colors on Apple's website. Uh, what this allows us to do, $39.99, is MSRP, but what's unique about this is in addition to it being a uh, wallet, it also has this, the built-in stand. So it allows you to have a stand, also holds four separate uh, cards, room for four cards inside, and you can see the window here, so you can have your own um, ID there. Very light design, 
in four unique colors. And so you'll, you'll continue to see, and it's also vegan leather, so you can see that, feel that soft touch. And you'll continue to see uh, newer products and newer designs leveraging that same technology. I really like this idea of MagSafe and a wallet and a stand. It's kind of getting it all done. Exactly. And that's what we're looking to do is have a complete family of products that is empowering the consumer to leverage the magnetic capabilities of their device. Very cool. All right. Got a couple more products down here? I'm going to show you one additional product at least because I know you got to go. This is our new international travel charger. So this is 145 watts of power that's going to give you the uh, ability to fully charge like your MacBook Pro. So four USB-C PD ports out. What's also unique about this, it allows you to simply remove this um, the power adapter. So he's uh, taking the US so, AC adapter. Exactly. So you can pull the US adapter out and then it comes with all these three different travel adapters for uh, all your international travel. Also comes with a nice little mesh bag to carry everything with you. And this is going to debut at 129. I love it. This is basically a throwback to something that Apple had years ago with our adapters, was you could pop the plug off and put the international plugs on, or as exactly. someone from New Zealand would say, put the U.S. plug on, which is the international plug to them. Exactly. So uh, you said it was 140 watts? 145 watts. 145 watts. And so it'll pull up to 140 watts of power. Depending on the combination of things you exactly. plug in. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. Now, wait, there's one more product I'm going to have to oh, show you. Oh, I knew he's going to do it. Satechi, which is known for all the different type of products to, to fully immerse yourself with uh, your desktop. We're launching our new mechanical keyboard. So the new mechanical keyboard is going to be launching. It's, it gives you that that it's nice, nice clicky finish. feel. Let's see. Yep, you can see and feel that. So we're announcing that also in the next, um, the day after tomorrow, we'll, we'll be having the press release. But that really rounds out the overall portfolio that we're going to be having that expands the consumer's uh, ability to both beautify uh, their desk and uh, have a full performance. Very good. Thank you, Chris. This is fantastic. That was that was a lot of products in a short amount of time. Well, we have a lot more coming, too. Oh, there so, you go. Keep an eye on Satechi, S-A-T-E-C-H-I. And where would we go to buy those products? Satechi.net. Very good. Thank you. Well, I am really jonesing for that three-in-one G2 stand, that fold foldable stand. That looks really cool for travel. And remember, when I was hearing this, I didn't completely understand all the things that were cool about G2, but this works for your Android phone if it supports G2. Hey, got any extra money laying around? Why don't you head over to podfeet.com slash Patreon and figure out a way that you can help support the show. I mentioned last week that when Steve and I were at CSUN's Assistive Technology Conference, we had the great pleasure to meet Chris Cook, who works for the Oregon Commission for the Blind. She's a serious tech nerd, so of course, we were, you know, we were instant friends. She kept re reaching into her purse and pulling out gadgets. It was awesome. Uh, I asked her to come on the show now to tell us about the visual interpreting surface. I think it's pronounced Ira that she's so wild about, and everybody at the table said it's the best thing ever. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Did I pronounce the name of Ira? Is that pronounced correctly? You did. Good job. That's right. <laughs> so it's spelled A-I-R-A -A for anybody who's looking for it. But we're not going to let you hear about that to start with. I just want a little bit of background on you, Chris. How did you get into being such a tech nerd? <laughs> well, uh, I think that I can honestly say that I grew up at a time when there wasn't a lot of really cool tech until I was probably ready for college. And so then I just took it on. So I am totally blind and I grew up with the Perkins Brailler and all those low tech types of things. And when I got to college, there were no computers and I did note taking with the slate and stylus and all that kind of good stuff. So then after college, I had a good friend who visited uh, one of the national conventions and she saw this wonderful thing from Australia called a Eureka A4 computer. And it had a braille keyboard and speech output and the thing created and composed music among many other things, along with note taking and a calculator and a little database. And there were some other um, kinds of uh, apps that it did. But the main thing was that it could transcribe music and print it out. Well, I was just starting a little career as um, a part-time school music teacher, and I could use all the help I could get because it was a private school and they didn't have any money, so they needed whatever I could provide in terms of curriculum. So she said, you've got to see this thing. 
So I took it on and learned how to use it. And um, that was the beginning of my tech journey because then, of course, um, I was you know, connecting it to a printer. And then I wanted a really a mainstream computer. And this was the early 90s by that time. And um, so I got uh, different computer equipment, um, including um, a little touchpad that I could control the computer and the speech output and how much it read to me. And those were the DOS days. So I just continued on going and kept my old stuff around and uh, my mom used to say, oh, yeah, give her a new piece of technology, slide some food under the door, and when she <laughs> figures it out, she'll come out. <laughs> so that's kind of the kind of the uh, story that I built along the way for myself. So Sounds like you're, it's in your DNA just to be a tech nerd. <laughs> it is. It really is. I've had so much fun along the way learning new stuff and trying to be on the cutting edge of things and really enjoying myself along the process. Oh, that's great. Like I said, I could tell we would be friends from the minute you opened your mouth. and Actually, from the minute you reached into your purse and said, check this oh, out, yeah. and pulled out a piece oh, of tech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And then, of course, getting on the iPhone bandwagon six months after it was accessible to us with voiceover, getting a 3GS iPhone. That was in a very early 2010 that I got my first iPhone. And I remember just sitting down with it one evening and just learning all I could and, you know, d- downloading apps and adding contacts and I was just going like a house of fire. So <laughs> it was just great. I loved it. Now, did you, uh, you're probably still not, not still on DOS, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing anything in the world if I was. Um, no, no, I'm dragging my feet about Windows 11, but um, I do use a Windows K- PC for work. And also I'm an Apple fan girl and have a Mac or two um, <laughs> in my collection. Um, and also, of course, iPhones and things. And I have, I did get a little bored last year and decided that I wanted to learn Android because some of the students I teach at the agency where I work were coming in with Androids. And we just, you know, we, we'd all um, in the Apple ecosphere and we really didn't know Android. So I took it on. And so I also have an Android phone that I really love because it has a British voice on it and it has touch ID. And those are two very important things to me, British voices and touch IDs. <laughs> Why does so, touch ID know, make a difference to you versus face ID? Oh, face ID creeps me out. You know, <laughs> I know probably they know everything about me anyway. And there's cameras everywhere, but I don't know. It just creeps me out. So I just really love just putting my finger on that little place and knowing that I'm in control of when it unlocks. And it's my finger. It just doesn't seem as personal as my face. I don't know. It's That's it's just my little a, weird an idiosyncrasy. An emotional yes. reaction to it, right? Oh, most, oh, yeah. Very visceral. Don't want it. Don't want to have anything to do with Face ID. Just don't. I've got it. <laughs> How I've do I really t- feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell a, a, an Android story from CSUN. Uh, I won't reveal where the person worked. Actually, no, I think you were with me. There was a guy uh-huh. named Earl that we were talking uh-huh. to, and we won't say where he worked. And we we were talking about, uh, you know, how we've been tempted to maybe take on using a, an Android phone for a month or two months or three months. Just immerse yourself and just give it a try, a good, honest try. And he mm-hmm. said... Uh, doing that is is like sucking on a cavity. You keep doing it again to see if it still hurts. Oh, oh no, that's painful. <laughs> that's terrible. I thought that was the best <laughs> analogy. <laughs> oh man. Oh dear. No, no, I didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, a little bit better than that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. All Apps right. Well, I dragged you in out. here to talk about uh, Ira. Oh, and that's, that's the- right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling we could go on forever. Um, oh, so yeah. the way you introduced me to the concept of Ira was you were talking about the Envision glasses that you had on that were based on the Google Enterprise platform, I think. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. But Ira isn't hardware. So why don't you start at the beginning and maybe give us the history of Ira and what, what it is? Sure. So Ira was founded in 2015 by a couple of um, college uh, students, and they were very much uh, thinking about their friend who was blind and how he wanted access to visual information. And so they were thinking about wearables and glasses and things. 
And so they founded this little company, I believe, uh, we'll say the San Diego, San Diego area. And um, so uh, it started out that they did have glasses. Uh, um, and so what Ira is, is a visual interpreting uh, tech company. And so they provide just that visual interpretation on demand with trained folks that are called agents. And then the folks who subscribe to the service are explorers. And so um, I tried the service out on a demo by one of our clients in 2017. And at that point, they did have these big glasses. And you had to hope that someone was available to answer your call because they didn't have very many agents um, at that time. And they were just getting started. So, now, so, so the idea is the agent sees what you see through the glasses. Yes, the gla- and then Yeah, that's the idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then okay. We, we were on a video call. And so um, if you're out and about, you're likely wearing bone conduction headphones or you could be listening to your phone speaker, but that's just a little unwieldy. So um, at that time, um, you're making a video call and you're using glasses. And I was so impressed when I was a part of this little demo that one of our clients showed us because after crossing the street a couple of ways, which they don't tell you when to cross the street, um, they can read the walk signal for you if you'd like, but you're in charge of your street crossing. And then um, we got to this building and there was no way to enter because they had the door locked. And so there was arrows pointing, you know, hey, enter this other direction. So we did. And then there was water on the floor. And so they alerted us to the the wet floor, you know, environment and different mm-hmm. things. And so I was so blown away by the amount of information and the confidence that I got from knowing real time. I didn't have to fumble around and go to that locked door and then try to figure out, okay, where's the other entrance? And, you know, it's just a real hassle when you get in unknown, sort of unpredictable situation. So... Fast forward a year later, one of my colleagues said that she had a very successful time going through the Portland airport uh, because there was free IRA access. So IRA grants free access because companies sign up and pay uh, to have the access given to anybody who is using the service. And it's a geofenced area. So once you go into that area, your phone recognizes because you're connected to the IRA service that you have free access. So uh, there's a way to find out all those free access locations, including many airports. There's Starbucks, um, I think AT&T, I believe Bank of America, several universities. There's just a whole ton of um, IRA access points. Let me let me break so in on you for a second here. So sure. uh, we haven't talked about what does IRA cost if you don't have free access? Well, that can be variable. Um, so I would just direct people to the website where they can find out more information about the pricing plans. Um, for instance, there are plans for people who belong to one of the consumer organizations, either NFB or I believe ACB as well. Um, and so I, I hesitate to You're quote using plans some acronyms here. information. Uh, National Federation for the, of the Blind and American Council of Blind. So... Okay, but I mean, um, is it is it a dollar a month, a thousand dollars a month? Is there you know just oh, any kind you, of a, just a ballpark? Yeah, um, I would say you are looking at maybe a dollar a minute. Oh, um, oh, oh you pay per minute. Yeah, you buy blocks of minutes. Okay, and so there might be thirty minutes, fifty minutes, um, okay, a hundred minutes, that sort of thing, and the price goes down the more minute the the more minutes that are in a block. But okay. you're paying so more because think, you're think buying like an more old minutes. cell phone plan than when we used to care about minutes is basically is... yes, exactly. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, so, so I might I might use my own minutes to get from the from the taxi to the front door of the airport, but as soon as I get in the airport, now I'm not using my own minutes. That's one of the examples, right? That's the idea. Yep. And so then you're switching over to the IRA access offer, the free offer. And um, then the the agent that you call can always um, switch things over in case they don't happen to, but they should switch over automatically. Okay. 
Okay. So, so, so mm-hmm. you you uh, mentioned that you had a first big adventure. Was was it during that demo, or is there another story to tell there? Oh, um, there's another story with that. So what happened is I signed up after I heard my friend go successfully through the airport, and I thought, I have to have this. And so I had lots of aha moments and lots of cool things happen, you know, successful shopping trips and, you know, street crossings and all kinds of things. But the very, very best thing that I did was I took a trip with my very best friend who is also blind and we went to Seaside, Oregon. We went to the coast, two blind ladies on vacation by ourselves. Oh, wow. We it was so fantastic because we didn't depend on anyone else's time, no one else's car, no one else's schedule. It was really fantastic. We took the bus down there and the driver kept wondering, what's going on with these ladies? You know, there's nobody here. Nobody's meeting them. We said, we're fine. You sure you know where we're, go- we're fine. Yep. Okay. Bye. <laughs> so the bus <laughs> took off and we just called Ira and said, hey, we want to go to lunch. So Ira walked us. They're tracking us on the map. So they have access to maps and they're watching us uh, as we travel um, uh, on the map, on their dashboard. And so they're directing us to the nearest, you know, hamburger place. And so we're just walking along. They're telling us what streets we're coming up to, what whether you need to turn or cross. And, and then, of course, not only are they seeing us walking um, our location on the map, but they're also looking out our phone camera so they can see where we are in real time. So, so it's stop, the, let me stop you a second. So mm-hmm. your phone camera, so are you having to hold it up in front of you? Or do you, uh, uh, I don't know, put it in a carrier on your chest? How are they looking out your phone's camera? Yeah, I've done both. Um, I, ha- I travel with a guide dog, and so it's handy to have hands-free. But I've traveled with a guide dog for so long that I'm used to having, uh, you know, bags or something else in my other hand. So it, it, it works okay for me, but it doesn't always work for other people to just hold the phone in one hand. So a lot of people get a holster lanyard type thing um, with a pouch and it can hang around your neck and then your back facing camera is what is watching the world. So, so um, they're looking through your phone's camera through the app, uh-huh. but they're talking to you through headphones, I assume, right? It's the best way to do it because then you can hear your environment. And um, a lot of us have gotten bone conduction headphones so that we can hear the environment around us and we're hearing the agent talking with us. So One of the people at lunch, I think it was Michael Babcock, was saying that Mm -hmm. um, one of the things he really appreciates about the IRA representatives is that they know when to talk and when not to talk. Like Mm -hmm. if, if you're listening to the, at the airport for gates being called, they wouldn't talk during that. As soon as it's done, then they would talk to you again. Things like that. Yeah, I would. I would think that they would do that. You, you can also tell them what level of information you want. Do you want a high level of information? I mean, do you care what the person looks like that's coming toward you, or that <laughs> that you need to maneuver around, or do you just want them to be quiet and walk with you? You know, I always tell them, "Hey, let me know if there are any stray dogs that are roaming around because I want to know for my guide dog's sake oh, right. if there's any other, you know, presence of any other animals in the area." Um, so you know, that sort of information you can communicate with them and tell them what you want to know. So do you tell each person when you call or is that in your profile or something? Um, it's, it's probably in my profile somewhere. I haven't filled, you know, filled that out for, you know, six years almost. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think it's in uh, certainly my guide dog and his presence, you know, the fact that that's the way I travel, um, that's in my profile for sure. So. And then yep. do you, so do you use Ira every day, once a month, only on travel? Oh, goodness. No, probably every day, um, at least. Um, I've already used them today. <laughs> so, okay. um, yeah, I use, use them, them around I, the house. Oh, uh, yeah, sometimes. Um, if I want to know if I got something clean or uh, when does the milk expire, for instance, because those expiration dates are really a pain to find and they're little and they're different places and they're hard to read and this kind of thing. And I could use I it for that. <laughs> I'm always sitting there looking at condiments and a friend of mine Uh got violently ill. Um, He got food poisoning, like so bad he woke up in the hospital. 
Like he ate <gasps> some relish, and the Ooh. next thing he knew, he was in the hospital. Oh, and it was because. No. And so now I'm terrified of all condiments. Oh, and yeah, I'm yeah. Real oh. serious about, it, but it's so hard to find those little labels. I know, I know, and I think they're used to looking at them for us. And so this one one lady said, uh, her uh, the agent said, "Oh yeah, I buy this kind of sour cream or whatever. I know exactly where this expiration date <laughs> is." So it really helps. Their lived experience can help us out. Um, Oh yeah, I definitely use them. I use them for so many things. Um, but just to to tell you about the thing about the big adventure was that um, when I went to Seaside is that I got to walk on the beach all by myself with my guide dog for about half a mile. And we looked for shells on the sand Aww. and they took pictures and they can take pictures of Whenever I said, if you see a good photo op, let me know. So I have lots of pictures of my guide dog with the sh sun shining on his fur Aww. and the beautiful um, waves and the, the sunshine. It was a gorgeous, clear day that day. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can save them and send them to you via email with descriptions, or they can also save them in the IRA app. So there's a place for your photos in the IRA app. And, and is um, that all working because you're wearing Google Glass or are they taking it with your phone or how does oh, that work? Okay, good question. So they, um, they, I, d I found the glasses were a little bit more work than I wanted to deal with because you had to connect them to um, uh, Wi Fi, like hotspot kind of a thing. Oh. And that was a bit more than I wanted to deal with. So um, I was then using my phone camera. Mm -hmm. And since then, they have gotten out of the whole glasses thing entirely and just focused on their software and their delivery of that visual interpreting experience. So they no longer use glasses that they make or that they, um, you know, bring in as a part of their service. Um, the service is available on the Envision glasses if you want to use those glasses to be the um, vehicle for which you know, your, your video feed is, is coming through those glasses. But in terms of Ira itself, it's not in the hardware business anymore. Okay. But you do use uh, the Ira service with the Envision glasses. Um, I have, um, I'm more likely to use it with my phone because if I just okay. want to do a little something or if I don't have a need to be walking about and, um, you know, hands-free, like, um, a, a lot, uh, in my daily work or my whatever I'm doing, if I'm not doing a lot of traveling and such, then I'm probably not going to use the glasses. I'm going to use the phone. I see. So I see. So, so yeah. the mm -hmm. experience, you launch the app on the phone and press go <laughs> and then so it connects. How's call an IRA agent. Yeah. So there's a button for call an IRA agent and then you are um, waiting and there's little musical tones to let you know you're you know, you're in the queue and then so-and-so answers and, you know, you know, um, they want to know what I want to do today. It's not, how can I help you? It's what would you like to do today? And they're very firm about that. They're not like, oh, we're way up here, sighted people helping you down there, blind people, you know, they're, they're absolutely not that way. So it's all mm -hmm. about what would you like to do today? So it's IRA visual interpretation on your terms. What, what are, what would you like to do? So they work for so. you. Not oh, yeah. they're oh, yeah. generously helping. It's exactly. they work for you. You're exactly. in charge. Oh, absolutely. We're always in charge. We um, ask them, you know, if they can help us in certain ways. Like, I'd like to do this task a certain way. Could you give me the, you know, the uh, what what you're seeing? Um, yeah. So it's it's absolutely, uh, you know, it's it's a really awesome, amazing concierge service that. I am so blessed to be able to pay for, but even if someone has a plan that is more limited, um, you still get five minute free phone calls every 12 hours if you have a paid plan. And there's a lot you can do in, in five minutes if you're organized. You can have your computer up and going. They can look at your screen through the Team Viewer app. If you have that on your computer, those annoying captures that are the bane of all of our existence <laughs> Um, <laughs> sighted people have trouble with them as well. You know, we can get the CAPTCHA sorted out. We can, um, you know, order something online that I'm not sure what it looks like, or we can uh, finish a checkout process or 
to click on something that we couldn't find. You know, there's a lot of things. Or if you're in your kitchen and you just want to read the back of a box of directions, um, and you know, if you want to do that or find those expiration dates for those products, um, you really can do a lot in five minutes if you're organized. That is really, really interesting. I, I think they it's must great. have fantastic training based on the fact that, that uh, both you and Michael and Marty Sobo, who was also at lunch, mm-hmm. all three of you, as mm-hmm. you were starting to tell me about it, they're both like, oh, man, it's the greatest thing ever. I totally rely oh, on this. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't oh, yeah. like just the nerd liked it. You know, these two guys were just 100% in too. Right, exactly. And they do get, uh, I believe, about 100 hours of training. Um, so... <sighs> Um, and reading a map is one of the qualifications for um, being able to uh, serve as an agent because mm-hmm. people do need to be able to read a map. You need your know your cardinal directions, your north, south, east, and west, and how to tell people how to go get places. And you know, it's I an lo- important skill. I love that. I run into so many people who can't. I, I remember calling a oh, restaurant yeah. and saying, "No, I, sorry, I'm the west side or the east side of the street." And she they says, "They did not know." No, she did. She said the right side. <laughs> I said, facing oh, what no. direction? She says, what do you mean? <laughs> and oh, I went no. around for quite a while. I said, okay, in California, uh-huh. the ocean is to the west. <laughs> it's really easy here. You know? Oh, <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're very highly trained. They're all individuals, though, and you get to know them after a while. If you call oh, really? a lot, you've been you know, there. You know, it's it's not like, you know, anything, you know, terribly personal about them, of course, but you get to know their voices and kind of what they've enjoyed. I think about what they've enjoyed, you know, working with me on. And, oh, there's so many ways in which Ira has been a part of my life. Everything from, um, of course, the daily uh, living kind of tasks, but they've also helped me on the tech end of things to set up computers. Um, I recently set up a Mac and voiceover didn't come up talking because I wiped it clean and started from scratch. So what for whatever oh, reason, it didn't come up. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it didn't. Um, and then I set up other computers. Um, I also um, publish um, digital sheet music online. So before I put it up online, they don't have to know anything about music. But if they could tell me if my margins are okay, if they look at the PDFs and I want to know, are the margins okay? Did any of the music run in, into any of the notes? That kind of thing. Hmm. Um, on the creative end, I... Um, I once took a three-layer um, s- strawberry, blueberry, white kind of layered um, Fourth of July Jello salad kind of dessert to a um, a potluck, and I wanted to smooth out the whipped cream on top. So they helped me do that. I held the phone in one hand and I had the, and the spatula in the other. We we're smoothing out whipped cream, and then I wanted to make a flag that was uh, shaped like blueberries like um take blueberries and put them down on top of the whipped cream in the shape of a flag and so they helped me make sure they were all nice and even and that it was flag shaped and that was amazing and then they took pictures of my awesome creation and of course i still have those and being able to take pictures that's another thing and share them with people i mean all of the fully sighted people do that you know and i am a part of that community now because not only do I occasionally take my own pictures, but mostly I have them take pictures like my animals. I have two cats and a guide dog. And if they're all snuggling together or something cute's happening, you know, I can quickly grab my phone, call Ira and say, hey, we have a photo op here. Can you please take a picture? And so, so then, do they you tell know, you getting, move yeah. a little to the left, mm-hmm. move closer, yep. move oh, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. They do oh, all that. Yeah, they make sure. And then when I'm hanging out with people, I can say, hey, I just had a really cute moment with my cat the other day. Do you want to see my pic? You know, that's what everybody does. And because I have Ira, I can be a part of that same experience and share those same things with people and feel very, you know, typical, normal, you know, every day, this is what we do. And, you know, it's just I've said fantastic. this before on the show and I, I do it with tongue in cheek. And yet it's not something that, sighted people I think innately understand is that blind people want to do everything that sighted people can do. Yep. That sounds really obvious, but I can't tell you how many times people say, well, why would anybody ever want to do that if you can't see? Oh my goodness. Oh wow. They're not being obnoxious. It's literally never occurred to them that that why would you want to do that? Was well because everybody wants to do that, you know? Of course they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's about sharing your life and your experience and 
you know, people resonate with pictures and I know they're cute pictures because I know my animals are super cute. And that's one of their favorite <laughs> things to do, by the way, is take pictures of people's pets. <laughs> so oh, they love so it. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me yeah. turn to the uh, dark side question because I know someone in my community or many of them are wondering right now, what about privacy concerns? You've given somebody access to your phone, your phone's camera, not only outside when you're walking around, but inside your house. How do you mm -hmm. reckon that? Yeah, so they um, signed some pretty strict confidentiality um, agreements. And so um, what I don't have any worries about that because I have trust in the service. And I also know that their job is on the line if they screw up. And so um, when people have that kind of, you know, if their job depends on them honoring those privacy um, statements and, um, you know, uh, agreements that they've signed, then I feel really comfortable with that. And yeah, so I would, um, I would think compared yeah. to say volunteers, for example, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, right. that would be yeah. a, a different thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And I explain that to my students that I teach too, because I let them know about um, volunteer services like um, Be My Eyes, that's great and out there for everyone and Ira that's paid. Um, and I let them know, you know, if you just want to know about the expiration date on your milk or how long you need to bake your pizza, call Be My Eyes. But if you want to do something more confidential, like look at your medical uh, report or your bank statement, or I've even, um, before I found the joys of doing uh, Turbo TurboTax with my <laughs> phone app, I've even had them help me fill in my tax return online. Wow. And they're not yeah. doing my taxes, but they're filling in information and they're helping me avoid all the upsell that um, TurboTax is going to do <laughs> and try to get me to buy the next level of their product. And I don't want that. And it could be really easy to miss that kind of thing. So um, I, I, I trust them. I've never been let down and um, they've always been there for me in, in that way. So I have complete confidence that they know what they're doing there with Very the good. privacy concern. No. Mm -hmm. There's some futuristic stuff coming to Ira, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's happening next? Yep. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Ira's name, because everybody says, well, what does that mean? A-I-R-A. -A. First, people are not sure how to say it, and that's understandable. And you have to train your phone to not say Ira. I think it's got Ira now. I've trained it to do that. But um, A-I-R-A -A stands for Artificial Intelligence Remote Assistance. Now, um, Suman Kanyuganti, who was co-founder of this uh, tech company, Ira, back in 2015, I think might have been thinking he's a visionary, so he might have been thinking about this at some point. But artificial intelligence, of course, we hear lots and lots and lots about AI. And so what uh, is being rolled out now is the ability to um, either take a picture in real time or access the photo gallery and have Ira's AI um, analyze the picture and send you back a description. And you can text the AI um, as we can with the service like Be My Eyes has an AI. So Be mm -hmm. My AI is something similar. But the advantage that someone has if they have an account with Ira is that they can, if they have any doubts about the image or it's more complicated than the AI is giving them resources to understand or they need a further explanation or they want to confirm something, they can always then uh, call and send the picture to an agent, to one of the Ira agents, and the agent can confirm what the description has uh, given them, you know, what what the explanation is of the image. And then if they have another question about it or they really don't feel satisfied with the answer or the level of detail, then you can call an IRA agent as your last step. And then then you're using your minutes at that point when you call an IRA agent. And then you can discuss that image or that um, document, whatever whatever you were looking at with the AI. Okay, so that triple layer of uh, being able to get something for free from the AI and then some written assistance and then talk on the phone if you need to. Right, exactly. So I think it gives people another way to access. And I uh, just got it yesterday, so I've been playing with it a little bit. And it seemed to return timely results, and I was timing it probably seven or eight seconds. I had the image description. and. Um, I uh, 
decided that I uh, was running out of time at the end of my day, so I was going to play with it some more. But um, I will be interested to query the agent if I had any questions. But I, I was satisfied with the results that it returned. But interestingly I, I enough... Teach, I did teach this uh-huh. audience that's listening to you right now. I taught them how to use Be My Eyes and Be My oh, AI great. in order to add uh, Excellent. captions. They are amazing can be my AI. Oh, yeah. I mean, better than I yep. would write. I used it, it yesterday to really do it, by something. the way. <laughs> That's really great. That's really great. Interestingly enough, I had, um, I had a, a, took a picture of a package of food, but I forgot to turn the lights on in my kitchen. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it said, Hey, it's either underexposed or there's not enough light. And so I thought, Oh man, I think I forgot to turn the lights on. So I went and turned the lights on. And then I was looking at the, um, at the package. And, uh, I appreciated, not that I needed to know this, but I appreciated that it said it was raw bacon as opposed oh. to cooked bacon. So that's a level of detail that I haven't had before. Um, yeah. because sometimes you might need to know whether something is fully cooked or if it looks like it was fully cooked or like it's still raw, you know? So it was a big old package of bacon and I got to what you know, I really appreciate that. from your descriptions is there's so many things I don't think about. I've been thinking about the big picture. How would I get from the door to my gate at an airport? That's a big mm. problem. But little mm-hmm. things like smoothing oh, yeah. out whipped cream. That would have never yeah. occurred to me that that would be something oh, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do. So I forget right. that, just the everyday little tiny details. And, and little also details. The, the mm-hmm. thing about the water on the floor, that really stri- mm-hmm. sticks with me because that isn't just turn left, turn right, open the door, you know, straight ahead is the elevator. That's, you're yep. going to fall if I don't tell you this. That's yep. good. That's yep. really different. And the other thing I was thinking about was when I was kind of describing it to people from what you you told me, I said, it's just like having a friend right there with you all the time, but it's better than a friend because the friend isn't chattering away about nonsense. They have, <laughs> this person has one job right. and it's to assist you uh-huh. in doing what you are go- trying to do. So it's exactly. it's really better than having a friend there. It's fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, and friends are not going to think of absolutely everything and and they have just a list of things that they normally are going to communicate to you. And so yeah, it's it's just fantastic. I and love it. I've I've tried to to help people uh the one thing I've learned uh walking my mother taught me this was never take somebody's arm. Oh, you can offer right. an arm. And yep. uh But then I don't think about everything. It's like when somebody gives me driving directions, they're in the car and they forget that I don't know to turn left. You Uh don't think about everything you know in order to convey it. But these people are trained to do exactly this one thing. This is is really interesting to me. And and I appreciate your giving us all this info on it. Um, Before we wind up, was there anything else you wanted to make sure you told us about? Wow. um, I... I think what I just want to leave people with is the myriad of options that are out there. And I think just deciding which option is best for which situation. If you need a high level of assistance with something technical or detailed or safety related or something that you think, hey, this would be uh, well served by human interaction, then I would just say... um, if there's a way you can, you know, earn a little extra money or find a little place in your budget, it is so worth having that option because there are the AI options, there are the volunteers, but having options, I think that's what a lot of us appreciate is that we do have options and we can use the best tool for the situation. And so just to kind of keep that in mind of, you know, um, it, there's a place for all of these services, and we hope that people are able to really avail themselves and enjoy all the independence that they offer. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So before we close out, though, we do need to talk about your podcast. Tell us about what you oh. do uh, in the uh, in the podcasting space, because I'm sure people are going to oh, want to sure. sign up. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, So I've wanted to do a podcast for a long time, but I was really kind of afraid of all the editing. And so finally, um, Michael and Marty uh, from the Unmute Presents Network came to me and said, hey, would you like to join us and and do a podcast? And so at first, um, 
these two things came right on the heels of each other. Um, they asked if I would do a podcast once a month. And so I chose uh, to do a podcast on Braille. So it's called At Your Fingertips, Braille Then and Now. And I talk about uh, things related, all things Braille, um, something from the past, like maybe a skill that I learned a long time ago or a tool that was developed a while ago that we still use, like the Slate and Stylus or uh, a tool, uh, you know, that that was then but is still used. And then I talk about something uh, related to what we're doing now or something we're looking ahead to the future. So whether it's a new Braille display or uh, one of my episodes was talking about making or buying greeting cards in Braille and where you do that. And so we talked about all the ways to either make them or buy them and the different advantages of doing each one. And so um, that drops um, usually on the first Thursday of the month. And so if people subscribe to the Unmute Presents Network, then they get all the shows on the network. And there's some great shows over there. I was recently on the Katie Talks Travel show, and we were talking about preparing for the CSUN conference and all the concerns I had about all my electronics and gadgets and, and everything. Um, the other um, podcast that I'm on that I really have so much fun with is uh, Michael and Marty uh, and I do a podcast called Digital Bytes. That's B-Y-T-E-S. And we have a little format for the show. It's kind of a three-pronged approach. We review an app. One of us will review a piece of hardware, whether it's a new pair of headphones or a keyboard or a speaker, something like that. And then the other thing is just a tip. And um, whether it's, you know, how to uh, shut voiceover up when it keeps repeating the time every minute, you know, or something like that. Um, or um, coming up soon, I'm going to do an Android tip because we know that we love Apple, but um, <laughs> we, there are some Android folks that are going to feel really left out if we don't talk about Android sometimes. So I'm going to be presenting an Android tip soon. So um, our show um, is each week and we record our digital bytes and it's not real long, but it's useful and we feel like it's helpful for people to have a variety of things to enjoy, whether it's a tip, a piece of hardware or an app that they would enjoy. So those are the two main podcasts that I'm on. Fantastic. Well, I thank you so much for coming on the show. If people wanted to connect with you, is there a social media platform? Please say Mastodon. <laughs> yes, I will say Mastodon. <laughs> and I'm creative, Chris, even though I'm really uh, techy. Um, you should find me at uh, creative Chris on Mastodon. Um, I think you I need am to tell us the server too, but I can look that up. Oh, um, yeah, it is the it is the tweeze cake. Um, T W T W E E Z E cake tweez cake and uh, just think cheese cake in your clothes. Uh, it is its own oh dot thing. It's at twe tweez okay. cake at tweez cake. Okay, I think we need one more uh, thing, but I'll I'll find it. And make sure it's in the show notes sure. so people don't Great. have to follow us blathering. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm new to Mastodon in the last say uh, nine, 10 months or so. So I'm still learning my way around. That's um, a lot of fun yeah, that's though. that's where you can find me. And I'm hoping to get the at your fingertips uh, dot tech website up and going as well in the email, but I haven't you know, been too busy working and trying to get everything recorded and all that sort of thing, but I will have that up and going at some point. Very good. Very good. Well, I expect we will have you back sometime soon because uh, anytime you want to talk about a, a new piece of tech that you found and want to come on the show, <laughs> I, I would love awesome. to have you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I told you Chris was awesome, right? I did a little more research on exactly what her Mastodon handle is. It's uh, at creativechris at tweezcake.social. And of course, there's a link in the show notes. The link to the chapter uh, for this segment is actually a link to the Unmute Presents podcast because her segments uh, at your fingertips, Braille then and now, and Digital Bytes, those are all folded into the same podcast into Unmute Presents with uh, Marty Sobo and Michael Babcock. So you've got the link there. And uh, you could just look for Unmute Presents in your podcatcher of choice if you'd like to go directly there. Well, that is going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? If you have a question or a suggestion, just send it on over. Remember, everything good starts with podfeed.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed.com slash Mastodon. 
If you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube, I'm not sure why people do, but they do, you can go to podfeet.com slash YouTube. If you want to join in the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways. You can support the show, like I mentioned earlier, at podfeet.com slash Patreon, or if you're more in favor of a one-time donation, you can go to podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, which will not be this Sunday, but a week from Sunday, head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.